Hi, and welcome to the Trusted Executive Podcast. I'm here with Dr. John Blakey, the founder of the Trusted Executive Foundation, which helps CEOs and leaders across all sectors around the globe create a new standard of leadership defined by trustworthiness. He's been named a top 100 global thought leader in trust by Trust Across America, and his work has been featured in Forbes, BBC, HuffPost, and the Sunday Times. So welcome, John. Good morning, David. Looking forward to another of our nine habits today. Yes, yes. And and as those that perhaps have uh, watched or listened to this before, they'll know that the idea of this podcast is to help you as listeners gain a practical understanding of the potential benefits of the trusted executive model to you through taking a deep dive with each of the nine leadership habits which underpin the model. Now, as you say in your book, John, you didn't just dream these nine habits over a glass of red wine. They're a product of six years of evidence-based research at Aston Business School for your doctorate, involving over 500 board level leaders. And with a deep passion, you offer the business world an academically rigorous and relevant answer to the question, how do I trust and why does it matter? So John, from your research as an introduction to those listening, why should they care about trust? And in a nutshell, what did you discover in your research? Yes, so why should we care about trust? Trust is the one thing that changes everything. Uh, That's a nice soundbite, but also we can show lots and lots of research over many, many years that documents the impact of trust on all sorts of important business outcomes, ranging from employee engagement to customer loyalty to bottom line profitability. So it is that glue that holds our cultures together. And what I found in the research is that the most important factor in building a high trust culture is the behavior of the CEO and the senior leadership team. So that role modeling, that leading by example is a critical driver of trust. So our habits, our day-to-day behaviors uh, either are building that trust one step at a time or they're eroding that trust one step at a time. The other thing I found in the research, David, is that on average, CEOs rate their trustworthiness 29% higher than those who work for them. And I call that the authenticity gap, that actually we're not as good at this as we think we are. um, And therefore we've got to be very, very wary that that authenticity gap doesn't grow to a point where we get a nasty surprise in terms of um, finding out that our trustworthiness is not quite what we thought it would be. Mm, I agree, John. And and, in previous discussions, we've looked really at how um, building this trust through the the nine habits is really a long-term journey. It's not like, you know, for my own examples, you know, sometimes in corporate life, you get execs coming in for a short period of time, they do certain things, they move on. But for me, I think the habit of trust is about, as you talk about, it's a triple bottom line. You're in here for the long-term, aren't you really? So you're really looking, as you say, to be authentic and actually to, uh, what's your behavior? How does this support trust in the organization? Yeah, it's a long term game. We talk about that triple bottom line results, relationships, reputation. Mm. Your reputation is something that you build over many years. And ultimately, that's what you're left with is that reputation. And so if you're playing the trust game, uh, then you're making decisions and you're looking at your habits based on uh, winning the long term game of a cast iron reputation for you and your brand. So today, John. We're going to do a deep dive with habit number five, which is about choosing to be open, which sits under the pillar of integrity. Now, I always say in these podcasts, I'm always drawn by with the fact that each habit starts with the word choosing, which makes it very intentional to me. And as we said earlier, that it's not just a one off. And I think you say actually that a habit is an accumulation of choices. And we spoke before we came on about the importance, really, of this habit of choosing to be open. And for me, how crucial it is, I think, in the the whole framework of trust. So for you, John, what does it mean to be open? And what are the benefits that it provides to the to the executive and to the organization? Yeah, what does it mean to be open? Uh, It's interesting. Last time we talked about being honest. And some people think, well, isn't isn't being open just another way of saying being honest? Isn't it just about telling the truth? And I think actually it's it's more than that. And 
I'm just going to reference one of the interviews that I did for my research um, in, in answering this question about openness, because one of the CEOs that I interviewed uh, gave me this uh, response when I talked about, you know, the importance of, uh, of openness. He said, as a chair going into a company, I'm getting uh, an instinct about the CEO. It's really important what my gut feeling says about their trustworthiness. I'm testing it out all the time. I'm watching how open they are. And it's interesting that that was, you know, the first thing that that executive would look for in a CEO, how open they are. And, and in, elsewhere in that interview, uh, when I asked about, well, what does that openness mean? He said, it means giving more of themselves. And I think that's the key difference between being honest and being open. It's one thing to tell the truth, but being open involves going further than that, to share more of who you are. And I think of Patrick Lencioni's uh, book title, David, are on this called Getting Naked. Um, and I think Patrick Lencioni, he wrote a book basically about this habit. He called it Getting Naked because basically what he meant with that title was being open means um, shedding the armor of executive leadership and making yourself vulnerable and open to a degree that for most of us in executive life, we have never been uh, trained or, or developed to be. And, and you mentioned how important this habit is. I reference in the book, uh, you know, research by the Institute of Leadership and Management that says that being open is the single most important behavior that inspires trust. And in my own research using the nine habits survey tool at the Trusted Executive Foundation, we found that on average, this is the weakest of all the habits that we survey. So typically in a corporate culture, being open is the weakest of the nine habits. So on the one hand, it's the most important. On the other hand, we can also say it's the weakest. So I think that makes this habit particularly interesting and intriguing for anybody who wants to master the game of trust. It certainly does. And I just had a thought that's really interesting because it's the fifth one. It kind of sits in the middle, doesn't it, John? You know, I know it's in the middle pillar as well, but out of five, you've got four either side of it. So it really is there. And I think I like how you say in the book that, you know, difference between being honest and being open, it's this vulnerability, you say, giving more of yourself. And I know we've mentioned this before, but I will say it again, because I think it's just so key that in kind of, or I think both of us, or I'll speak for myself, you know, working through, you know, organizations that have been very hierarchical and patriarchal, it really goes against the grain for myself as a white male leader to actually be vulnerable because it's that, that climate, isn't it? That actually vulnerability can be seen as weakness because yeah. I don't have the answer. So, yeah. so what have you found about that in your research and, and what comments would you like to make, you know, particularly to those white male leaders are going, oh, this sounds really hard, you know, what benefits, how do I manage this? Yeah, and, and, and I am one of them, aren't I? I am, I am a white male leader of a certain age, uh, an, an alpha male as the language would, would go. Um, I wasn't brought up to show vulnerability and, and weakness. Um, I was brought up to be this invincible hero figure um, of leadership. And you mentioned this word patriarchal, mm -hmm. you know, that we have to, I think, recognize that we, we have lived in a patriarchal time. And we, and we talk about, you know, in our work as the, 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 the age of power versus the age of, of trust. And in the age of power, um, you didn't show vulnerability. It was a patriarchal um, hero leader time. But I think we're seeing a change in that, um, David. I mean, obviously with diversity and inclusion, we all know that we are now um, being invited to step into a new age uh, that isn't patriarchal, that is much more uh, diverse and inclusive. And it's also an age of, of trust where showing your full human self and allowing others to show their full human self is key mm -hmm. to building relationships of mutual respect rather than relationships of domination and power. And I, and I think that's, that's, that's the reason why I think leaders really need to embrace this habit at this time is that you cannot use power as the currency of leadership in the way that we typically did and we're having to wean ourselves off those habits of power and learn these habits of trust and probably the one that you know for me personally we'll talk about this later I'm sure you know I know this is one of the hardest habits that I'm working on uh, is to try and unpick the, the the habit that that told me to be um uh, professional to be all conquering to not show weakness 
and unpick that and try and actually practice being fully authentic and human that I do have bad days. Uh, you know, there are some that I make mistakes. Um, you know, my own nine habits that I wrote about, do I ever break the nine habits? Of course I do. And so I have to sort of work out how do I on the one hand still evangelize about the benefit of these habits whilst also showing up as a, a real human being who, who makes mistakes. Um, one of the quotes that I, you know, like in this area is, you know, the, it's a quote that I learned at, at Vistage was, uh, remember before you were a CEO, you were a human being. And it, it, it sort of sounds, people laugh often when I, when I share that. And the reason they laugh is because they realize that it reveals that when you step into this role of leader, you put on this mask. Um, and, and what this habit is about is about taking off the mask. Now, now, hopefully in the long term, that's a relief because you can be yourself, um, you know, and it's hard work putting on a mask. But in the short term, taking that mask off um, reveals um, that vulnerability. And that's that's a sort of moment of uh, a difficulty, I think, for a lot of clients. It, it is, John. And I, and I think I would also link it to and we're seeing the development and growth and implementation of emotional intelligence in the workplace. And if I'm being vulnerable here, John, one of my things that I really had to work with, because I'm with you on this, is this aspect of vulnerability. And when I first understood this aspect of vulnerability for me is about being, as you said, strong and caring. So this aspect almost of, and for masculine, I don't mean male, but masculine traits and feminine traits. And I believe you know, male and female all have these traits, but strong and caring. And what that meant to me, John, and it was a shock to me, was that when I got into the aspect of, in order to be vulnerable, you know, how am I feeling? What do I want to share? There were often times when I wasn't sure what I was feeling. So my honest truth was I printed off from the nonviolent communication work a list of feelings so actually in certain situations, I would re quite often I'd refer to this list and have it on my desk and go, OK, this is what I'm feeling in order to actually bring that to the service for service, service, surface, I should say, for me. But it was just a it was an understanding for me the way I'd been brought up to uh, diminish the feelings to, as you say, to be strong, to always have the answers. It really got me in touch with my vulnerability to probably a shocking extent, John. But, yeah. but the benefits of it have just been tremendous. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we've mentioned Patrick Lencioni. We can't talk about vulnerability without mentioning Brenny Brown. Mm. Um, you know, her book, uh, Daring Greatly. I'm, I may have done six years research in trust, but uh, Brenny Brown did 12 years research on, on, on vulnerability. And uh, what I, the quote that I love from that work, Brenny Brown says, uh, vulnerability is the first thing I want to see in you and the last thing I want you to see in me. And uh, that pretty much characterized mm. my approach to vulnerability for the first, you know, 30 years of my career. Um, I love it when you do it. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, I, I don't really want to sort of jump into the pool first. Um, but leaders go first. And I think that's one of the challenges of this habit is that we as leaders are challenged to go first with showing vulnerability in the right place at the right time. Uh, but it's about having that courage to, um, to show a bit more, to give a bit more. And as you say, the emotional, uh, to declare your, the reality of your, your emotions and to own that and be open about that rather than seeking to, uh, to project our judgment onto others, which I think is what we do if, we, if we're not connected with our emotions and declaring those, uh, what often we do is, is actually convert that into judgment of other people. Um, and, you know, we see a lot of behaviors in leadership, you know, micromanagement, perfectionism, you know, that, that critical parent sort of style, a lot of which probably comes from um, that withholding of emotional openness that allows for a different type of conversation to happen in a, in a leadership team. You mentioned there Brenny Brown, uh, Daring Greatly, and one of the books I've got of hers is, is she's also written Dare, Dare to Lead. So she does talk about how it is, and I think you mentioned this, how it, it involves truth, how it involves courage, and just what we've been talking about, really, you know, she talks about some of the myths of vulnerability, you know, that, that people might think, well, vulnerability is weakness, that actually people might say, actually, I don't do vulnerability, um, that actually people believe as a leader they can go it alone, 
um, that they can actually engineer, which is really interesting. They actually, she says some people believe they can engineer vulnerability. And I guess we've both been in meetings where I'll choose on, on, I'll choose on myself, you know, male white leaders have pretended almost engineered to be vulnerable when it wasn't such a thing. They were just trying to catch the trend. So I think this particular one has depth to it. And I think there are situations, John, where actually when you witness it, it changes the way you are as a leader. So what I wanted to ask you, because again, in the book, you talk about your own journey because you, mm. and you, you talk about how you learned from the co-founders of Team 121. So what did you learn there? Because I think there was a great point you made in the book. Yeah, you know, when I joined Team 121, which was a very young 70 person tech consultancy. I'd previously worked for 13 years with global corporates like Cadbury Sweeps and, and British Gas. So I was very immersed in that corporate pinstripe suit sort of culture in which there wasn't a lot of vulnerability being shown. And I turn up one day in this, as I say, very young, chaotic consultancy led by two um, 30-year-old um, entrepreneurs, Rudy Bublitz and Ian Barker, who'd founded that company literally around a kitchen table. And the great thing about Ian and Rudy is they'd never done an MBA. They'd mm -hmm. never been on a graduate training scheme. Um, they'd never read a book on leadership. So they were sort of literally making it up as they went along. But because of that, they had this openness, this, this raw openness about them which inspired me and showed me a, a different way. And it expressed it itself in two different ways. Rudy Boblitz, um, the way Rudy um, expressed his openness was in his dress sense. I mean, I remember in the first week of going to work at that organization that we went to do a pitch at an organization in the Northeast of, of England and Rudy turned up in an orange suit and a polka dot Dr. Martins. And we walked into this boardroom to pitch, uh, you know, a multi-million pound project. And I thought, goodness gracious, you know, we will be kicked out of here. We'll be down the M1 as fast as, you know, <laughs> as we came up. It. Um, and, and we actually won the, we won the work. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. We, we won the work. And I asked the, the project director of this uh, program later when we were kicking off the project, I asked him why we'd won this work above the likes of Accenture and Deloitte and all these other grand brands that we've been up against. And he turned to me and said, oh, um, yeah, you won the work because you were reassuring the amateurish. And at the time, I didn't understand what he was saying to me. But now looking back through the lens of this work and research, I realized that what he was saying was you were human. Uh, you had a character, you know, you know, you were different. Um, you were authentic. And that, that appealed to them. Um, and, and obviously, you know, that was back in 1996. Um, I think if it appealed to them in 1996, it certainly is going to appeal to them in 2021. So that, that human um, connection is, is very attractive. And, and Ian Barker, um, you know, the other co-founder, Ian revealed his openness in a slightly different way. But I, I remember going on lots of flights, long flights with, with uh, Ian, you know, and if I'd have been on a long flight with a managing director in Cadbury Sweeps, I think it would have been a very terse um, and long conversation, you know, and, and, it, and it would be very, um, yeah, awkward. I couldn't imagine anything more awkward, sorry, uh, to, be, to be frank. But with Ian, you went on a flight with Ian and he poured his heart out to you. I mean, you, you'd be, you'd be uh, you know, 30,000 feet above the, the Atlantic and, and uh, Ian would be telling you his innermost secrets. And, and, I, and I found this very odd, but I found it strangely inspiring because I realized that he, he was the same as me. And that if he was the same as me and he started this company and he was being successful in the way that he was, I thought, well, maybe this is possible, you know, that you can do leadership a different way. And I mean, that company was hugely successful. We grew from 70 people to 440 people. I became a director of the company and we sold it in 1999 to Logica for 75 million pounds. So from a point of view of results, it was incredibly successful, but it had a lot of these habits. And the one of the habits that were particularly shone out, which everybody still talks about fondly who worked at that company is that openness, that authenticity, everybody showing up as exactly who they are and the talent that that unleashed in that culture was it was a joy to behold. 
I think that's a fantastic point, John, that I think what you've highlighted for me there is that when as an exec, they really embody this habit, choosing to be open and be vulnerable, it gives other people permission to be the same. As you said, that unleashes creativity. It actually, I think, develops a real depth of, of team spirit and, you know, a spirit of the core of being together. And I've experienced that in times when I've opened up and shared almost like John, the atmosphere has changed because something has opened up where actually the team have felt actually it's okay, as you said, to be me. This is somewhere where I can be me. I don't have to worry about what I'm saying. So I just think it's such an important, such an important habit. Now we could talk about this, just this point, I think for, for ages, but I think what we'll move on to actually is people are probably getting already an understanding of what choosing to open is, is and how challenging it is. But they're also probably curious from a practical perspective, saying, well, I've heard John speaking, but how about some executives that have actually used this leadership habit to make a real difference in their organisation? Well, again, we're privileged to have Fiona Furman, uh, well, join us in a pre-recorded interview. She's a communications manager from NHAL Group, and they've embodied the trusted executive model in their organisation. So we're going to hear from her now on how they've used the habit choosing to be open. And I know you haven't heard this, John, so I look forward to hearing your response. Hi, once again, I'm with Fiona Thurman, the communications manager with NAHL Group, a group of consumer legal businesses, including National Accident Helpline. And as an organization, NAHL are using the trusted executive framework to empower the way they work and serve their customers. And today we're still in the second pillar of trustworthiness, that of integrity, the extent to which we walk our talk. And we move on now to the fifth leadership habit, choosing to be open. So Fiona, how have you used the fifth leadership habit, choosing to be open within NAHL to make a real difference in your organization? Well, one of the real um, areas uh, that I wanted to talk about was there were some big changes coming externally to the way that one of our areas of business operated. And so what that area of the business did was we had to change how we worked and how we operated in order to uh, combat the, the impacts of this, this external change that was coming, coming into our, our area of work. Um, and so obviously as, as, a, as a business, as an aim listed business, we had to be very careful about what we said externally. But what we did was we brought our staff into that conversation. We were very, very open with our staff right from the beginning and saying, this is what we're thinking about doing. Um, obviously we had to sort of say this isn't for public dissemination this is just for you but we brought them into our thinking brought them into our planning and what happened then was that our staff became trusted partners in that development so they weren't staff who things were being done into and they would give feedback and say have you thought about doing it this way have you thought about maybe trying this and that feedback was taken on board and we made changes as a result um, but it was so important that we were open with staff that we brought them on really really early they were very authentically trusted partners in this enormous change that needed to happen and now that we're sort of coming out the other side of, of that change we've seen the impact of that on our people um, because they're so much more brought into it because they were brought into it right at the very very beginning before it was even you know a plan in in some cases and so um, we've seen that that commitment now from our people to make that new plan work um, is so much greater but also it really helped their sense of their place in the business, which as I've said, was as a trusted partner rather than a team of people who would be done unto and be told that this was a change that was happening and you've just got to get on board and make it happen. You know, they were already well on board, really early doors. I just want to move on briefly to, to dig a little deeper, as I say, in that this choosing to be open is quite often around vulnerability. Mm. So what has been a personal insight or a personal growth moment for you in choosing to be open? When you're open, it can dispel fear. Um, and I think that's so incredibly important as well for staff to enable them to feel comfortable because when staff feel comfortable, then they can perform um, so much better. And I think that's what I've really seen. That's been the real kind of light bulb moment for me, if you like, is this sense that um, when we when we're not open, then the space, the space that is left um, can become filled with 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 things that aren't true. Um, and that has a detrimental impact on the business and also relationships within within the business, because that can affect trust and um, that can impact um, the trust quite severely and then whenever we're trying to do other things where we need staff to trust us that's a little bit not broken but it's certainly a little bit frayed um, and I think that's that it's so much harder then to kind of um, 
uh, reattach those little frayed bits into into the strong the the, the strong the strong piece. Um, so I think that's been that's been the, the the real light bulb moment for me is just that sense that you know we need to be open. It's not although we choose to do it, it kind of isn't optional in that sense because we we choose not to at our peril um, because that that space will always be filled. Mm. Thank you, Fiona. And, and what came to me is as you choose to step into the fear of being vulnerable, then I heard you actually then say that what then seems to happen is then that the, the fear reduces around you know, the people around. So step into the fear to reduce the fear seems counterintuitive, but um, that's what I hear coming through that and the power of really choosing to be open so uh, yeah and the long-term benefits of that as well you know if you if you sort of step into your own fear to reduce the fear of the people around you then the long-term impact of that um is is so much better for you as a leader um and it's so much better for you as, as a business as well mm, builds a trust so thank you fiona i really appreciate uh, your sharing around choosing to be open thank you John, some great sharing there from Fiona. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you, how you, uh, what you have to say. Yeah, fantastic. There was a key moment there, wasn't there, David, when Fiona said, when you're open, it dispels fear. Mm -hmm. And you picked up on it because you then picked that up and you said, isn't it interesting that when you step into your own fear, you, you disperse the fear in others? And I think this is, this is a key point um, about this habit um, that when you're open, it dispels fear. But in order to be open, you have to face some of your own fears. And I think that's the leadership step, isn't it? That the leader is the one who faces their own fears first and then can help others overcome and move forward. And Fiona talked about it, particularly in the context of a change, you know, that there was a change happening in the business. And we know at the moment we live in a a very volatile, uncertain, chaotic world where that change is coming at us all the time and it creates fear and uncertainty. And what Fiona's revealed there is that openness can um, dispel that, that fear. And therefore, when she talks about this being a necessary habit, I think it's necessary because of the rate of change that we're going through, that we need this openness if, if we're going to embrace this change constructively rather than that it overwhelms us and creates anxiety and, and stress. Now, she also talked about there an aim listed PLC and that you know there are certain rules and regulations about the degree of openness that is possible in certain environments. And so you know, one of the health warnings I just want to sort of throw in on this habit is that you know, we're, we're inviting leaders to, to, um, to challenge themselves to be more open than they historically have been. Um, that doesn't mean that we're saying, you know, you need to be open about everything all the time, uh, because actually on the scale of openness, we've probably been at 10 percent. And what we're inviting people to go to is, could you think about going to 15 percent or 20 percent? And sometimes people say to me, yeah, but you can't be open about everything, can you? No, you can't. I'm not asking you to go to 100 percent. Nobody's saying that that's where we want to be. But what we are saying is, let's let's take the next step. Let's be a bit braver um, with this habit if in doubt and you're faced with a situation and I, I might talk about a situation later David where I was faced with a, a bit of a dilemma you know uh, could I be more open could I be less open and, and what we're saying in those situations if you've got a dilemma choose to be more open because in that way you are you are moving with the times uh, and you are modeling this this habit yes yes it, it was it was a great Great insights actually from Fiona, uh, and one fi one final thing we were talking before about. Um, and you said actually when 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 you get really embody this habit, it can unleash the creativity. And you probably heard us say actually, as you said, you know, they shared things that perhaps organisations might say, well, we're not sure if we can do. They kept within the aim guidelines, but because people felt involved, they were actually then were making suggestions that got that got involved with this uh, you know that got incorporated into what they were doing and as she said coming out of that they just really benefited from it so we just a sense you know when, and there was a slightly longer interview I did with her that it unleashed the creativity in the organization um so it was a really great example of what you've just been speaking about really yeah yeah I think it's it's um it's an enabler this habit it, it, it unlocks uh, people's talent it unlocks their potential it it unlocks um that commitment 
um, to really uh, get people involved and brought into, particularly when there's there's a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty in the environment. Mm. Now we've already touched on this because I said, "Oh, listen, it's, this is is perhaps not coincidental that this sits in the habit, sorry, in the middle amongst all the other habits." So my next question is, how does this habit of choosing to be out and work alongside the other habits in the model? Yeah, I thought about this before the the, the podcast, David. Um, and actually, your point about it sitting in the middle, I've never realised before that it sits in the middle, uh, but it does, and uh, maybe that's not a coincidence. So I think that's an important um, point. Um, but there's two habits I've probably mentioned that, that I think about in relation to um, the habit of being open. One is the habit of being brave. Um, we've talked a lot already in this podcast about being open, showing vulnerability. It involves a degree of risk. It involves bravery and, and actually in some cases uh, moral bravery to, to do the right thing and be open about information and, and feelings. Um, so I think it's, it's linked to that habit in terms of the two working together. If there's one habit where I think it's in tension with, it's probably the habit, habit number one, the habit of, uh, of delivery. Because I think the habit of delivery is all about professional results. It's about delivering on time to budget to quality. And I think when you're under the pressure of delivery and you're very, very focused on that habit, that's where this habit of openness can almost seem to be at best a distraction or, or at worst unprofessional. I think that's a word I hear sometimes in relation to this habit, you know, people sharing all this stuff, isn't it, is, is it, is it really professional? And of course the word professional is all about the idea of as professional people, we do put on that mask because we're here to deliver and that's our job. And I think in, you know, you, you can understand that, that in certain situations, again, depending upon the um, circumstances, that delivery is the priority. And it might not be appropriate to be open in the midst of that intense delivery. Think about emergency services. You know, if I'm attending a 999 emergency call as an ambulance uh, worker, you know, um, I'm not necessarily going to want to suddenly burst into a bout of vulnerability whilst I'm in the middle of a crisis. So I think, you know, this is again where we see that the model, the habits are intention in some cases, and then they work together in other cases. But the whole point is to think about these things, to have conversations about this, and to raise our awareness of how we can use this model together collectively as a holistic approach to sustainable success. Yes, thank you, John. And what's come to my mind is, is really this habit choosing to be open feels like it um, has an intuitive sense to it, that it's, that it's more of an art rather than a science. And I think that's what Brenny Brown was alluding to when she was saying people try and engineer this vulnerability, this choosing to be open, when actually it's, it's more about sitting out coming from the heart, being vulnerable, but also still engaging, as you said, you know, the, the results aspect, the critical thinking aspect of, of just questioning, actually, is this appropriate to say this now? It's not that you're, you're hiding anything, but as you said, choosing to be actually what's the most appropriate to be shared in this moment. Where, as you said, where can I go? And you're going more than just the 10% than perhaps you'd, you've traditionally done. And, and one final comment on that is actually when I chose to do a, a master's on exploring the role of actually spirituality in the workplace, one of the comments that really moved me to, to explore this was one of the academic articles I read was about how someone said they were sick and tired of going into work, taking off their jacket, it was a male person, taking off their, their suit jacket, having to be someone that they didn't really want to be, so they weren't authentic, then putting on their, their suit jacket, going home and being someone completely different because really had this innate feeling that they wanted to be, they wanted to share that openness, that vulnerability about who they were and what was important to them. Um, so it is, I think, such a, such a key one. Yeah, and you think about the times that we're in and we've been in, David, with COVID and lockdown. Lockdown has forced, I think, even more openness uh, into our working world mm. because we're all sat, you know, we're sat, you and I sat here in our homes, we're, we're dressed in our, you know, our casual clothes. Um, we're seeing, literally seeing into each other's lives um, through Zoom. 
And that level of intimacy, you know, delivering Zoom calls where there's a four year old child that, you know, suddenly comes up to, to your client with a picture of a giraffe and says, you know, what, what do you think of this, daddy? Um, you can't ignore the human um, reality when you're working in this way. And, and, I, and I think that's 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 the way that we're going to continue to to move. We, we, we will become less formal. Uh, we will become more open um, it, for some people that will be a difficult change. Um, and I understand that, um, but I don't think we're going back to the, the straight jacket of, uh, of the 20th century corporate world. I totally agree. So for those listening and watching out there, um, what further resources or perhaps hands-on experience this habit, choosing to be open, would you advise them to try out to make a real difference for them? Well, yeah, we mentioned, haven't we, um, reading? And so Patrick Lencioni, Getting Naked, yeah. Brenny Brown, Daring Greatly. I think those are two great go-to resources on this particular habit. I also think this is a habit where, where feedback is, is, is really important. And, and, you know, I mentioned earlier, our, our, you know, we have a survey tool that can survey these habits within a culture. And this habit of being open, what we found is that that is typically one of the weakest habits in a culture. Mm. And therefore, when we've, when we've surveyed it and then we've played back the results of that survey to a leadership team, it prompts some very interesting discussions. And I, so I think that's a resource is, you know, getting data, getting feedback, um, you know, for those that are wanting to be very open, um, you know, being coached, I think, on, on, this, on this habit is key. I think there's only so far that you can go reading books, um, you know, collecting data. I think there is a point where if you really want to work on this habit, then having a safe place with a suitably qualified uh, facilitator is, is a great way to uh, exactly that, make it safe for people to explore this and, and, uh, and uh, experiment with it. So it is something I think is quite experiential um, that is it's important to practice, to have that support. Um, maybe of all the habits is the one where, yeah, a degree of that external facilitation is, is wise. Mm, thank you, John. And I'll also put links below to the Trusted Executive Foundation and obviously to the book, The Trusted Executive. And I was going to say, just to close out this point, you know, the book is, is a fantastic read, but really just hearing you speak there, it, you know, one of the phrases that came to my mind is using these habits and particularly the one choosing to be open is not a spectator sport. It's actually you have to get yourself off the, off the bench, off the sidelines, onto the pitch. And, and I think you learn really through, through the experiences that you have with, with all the habits, but particularly I think with this one, choosing to be open. Yeah, and a really, a really sort of quick uh, tip for, for leaders on this one who are thinking, well, you know, where might I start? Um, one of the things I think really works well uh, here is with this habit is to, is to find examples of people doing this well mm -hmm. and then recognize people for it, praise them for it. So there are many leaders who might be sat in a leadership team meeting and they might find a member of the team suddenly burst forth with, with, with and being open about, some challenge, uh, some issue, or it might be just something in their personal life, but they're sharing more. And when somebody has shared more like that, afterwards, they, they might think, oh, was it appropriate? Did I do the right thing? And I think one of the things that leaders can do to really give permission for this is when it happens, recognize those people. Even better if you recognize them publicly and, and you can actually say to someone, thank you for sharing. I know that was difficult. But I think it's important that in this team, we're able to bring our full selves to this work. And just a, a, an affirmation of that in that way gives that permission, makes it safe. And giving that feedback, um, when you see other people doing this, um, then affirming it and welcoming it and recognizing it is a really important step in helping others also follow that example. It's a great point. And actually, I've heard executives say to me, or I've been coaching where they've said something or they've given an example where they said something. They've actually said that. I'm not sure if I was too open. Should I have said that? But actually, when you when, when I've sat with the point, it actually when they've reflected on it, they've gone, actually, it made such a difference in that moment. And and it was almost like some of them said, it gave me permission that I don't, I'm, I don't, to, I sometimes say I can feel under the pressure that I feel like I've got to have all the answers. 
that's not a reality for me. I mean, it feels vulnerable to actually share that reality, but it felt so important to do it. So um, I think that, that is really important. So um, also in the book, there is a chapter in the book which is called Cracks in the Pillar, what to do when things go wrong. And I love this because it's, it's kind of grounded realism for me. And you've already alluded, already alluded to, you know, that there's times when, when you struggle with the habits or you don't meet them. And as I said before, I know you, you walk the talk, you, uh, you're a pragmatist, you want a failure. Um, but before we dive a bit deeper on this, choosing to be open, um, I just want to explore for you, what can an organization do when choosing to be open goes wrong? Because you've, you've said in, in the book that trustworthiness is a kind of, it's a multi, it multiplies across ability, integrity, benevolence, the three pillars. So if you get a zero on any of the habits, impact, impacts across trust as a whole. So when an executive um, perhaps has, you know, has fallen down in this habit, choosing to be open, what can they do? And perhaps what other habits might they choose to draw on to help them out? Yeah, I think this is the one habit, David, where if you get it wrong, you do get a second chance. I mean, there are other habits, like if you fail to deliver, if you fail to be honest, it's a little bit more digital. Mm. Um, but I think with a failure to be open, what it basically is saying is that there was a moment in which you could have shared more and you chose not to. And actually, obviously, because you didn't share anymore, nobody really knows the difference. Um, you know, the people present probably didn't realize there was more to be shared necessarily. But you do get a second chance because what's not being shared can always still be shared. And so you might have a monthly meeting, you might have found yourself in a bit of a dilemma, you know, do I share more about this or more about what's going on for me at the moment or do I not? And in that moment you decided, actually today's not the day. Um, but actually a month later in the next leadership team meeting, you may find that it is the day that you think, yes, I'm now going to share a bit more. And so I think one of the things with openness, I think is to have patience with yourself and with others, that this is a habit that can um, build over time. If you work on the other habits, you know, then you're creating this high trust culture and this high trust team. You're creating a safe space and that safety will bring more openness over time. So I think this is a habit where patience is important uh, you don't have to get it right immediately. Um, you will get a second chance. And if you work on those other eight habits to create that safe psychological space, you will find yourself and others starting to be more open over a period of time. Mm, thank you, Johnny. I really get that. And, and thank you for mentioning um, psychological safety, which has obviously been written about a lot now. We've, we've, think we've spoken about it before as to how Google said it was one of the most important things in their, in their team. So, so yes, I can see how using the other eight habits, you're building this psychological safety that actually enables uh, choosing to be open to actually then be expressed in a way which feels, as you said, you know, it feels safe. It feels it feels something you choose to step into. And we're back to this, and I think Fiona mentions it, you know, we're back to choosing to be open. And I, and I like that aspect of, it doesn't mean that it's all the time, but you can be reflective. And I think there's something then about, um, which I always said is important, and I hadn't thought of this before in respect to this habit, but I always say there's, there's a pause you can put in as an executive where this choice comes in um, because as an executive, you can just react or you can put this pause in and then choose to respond. Or from open perspective, you might choose not to respond or not choose to say something. But it's this choice which brings in this element of, of self-awareness, which is so important for me in conscious leadership. So, um, gosh, this habit really is, um, it really touches on a number of areas, doesn't it, John? Yeah, we, we, we haven't talked about the habit of coaching that, you know, what's the best way to encourage others to be open? Ask them a question, um, you know, and, and that's the coaching skill. Ask them a question and then listen and accept their answer. You know, one of the things I've seen with this habit of being open is that when people choose to share something that's maybe quite personal, quite difficult for them, there's an instinct in a lot of us as leaders to want to then try and fix it. But actually, if you're in that coaching mode, 
then you listen and you accept and you recognize it and you acknowledge it, that in itself is a great step and often it is all that that person needs in that moment. They don't necessarily need you to rush in and fix it. And I think that is sometimes in our, in our I say, traditional mode of leadership, we think, oh, blimey, there's a problem. I'm the one who fixes problems. You know, let me dive in and, 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 and sort it out. But if you're in that trusted executive mode and somebody's open with you, then you bring in that habit of coaching, which is, thank you. You know, you demonstrate that you've listened and you accept, and then you trust that actually that of itself brings its own benefits without you having to save the day or, or, or put the, put the superhero cape on. Mm. And again, actually you've, you've highlighted to me this aspect of if I as an executive choosing, if I'm choosing to be open and the, the culture of the organization then becomes more open. The other skill it also brings in then is how I'm then present when other members of my team are choosing to be open. So it also really highlights, it's not just how I'm practicing the habit, it's how I'm honoring others practicing the habit, which actually is quite, that's quite profound and quite, um, quite beautiful, I think. Mm. Now talking of profound, we get to my favorite part of uh, this podcast. Is this where I have to be open? It's, it's, you, you choose to be open and vulnerable, John. And, and I love this part because I know you spent a long time researching and developing this model and uh, obviously setting up the Trusted Executive Foundation. And, and I know from, from personal experience just how passionate you are about trust and, and all of the habits. But looking specifically at choosing to be open, let's now dive a little bit deeper. I know you love this. And <laughs> we want to ask you what this, this habit personally you know, why this habit personally matters to you. You know, you said before there are two levels for you, you know. So, yes, I am inviting you to be open and be vulnerable and, and explore more deeply for you. So why is this important to you, this habit? Yeah, well, let's, let's, let's take both, both levels, um, David. And, um, yeah, the first level is, uh, as a leader, why is it important to me? Um, I, we have a 360 feedback tool for these habits, and I... And I I had to test the feedback tool to make sure that it worked. But unfortunately, I also got some feedback. Um, and, and part of the feedback I got was that this is actually one of my weakest habits alongside being kind. Um, so this has been important to me because I know I'm on a journey with it myself. I mentioned earlier about, I, I found myself in a dilemma a few years ago when on the, on the Thursday, I was due to deliver a webinar first thing on a Friday morning. And on the Thursday, my friend and co-author of Challenging Coaching, Ian Day, had a massive heart attack and his heart stopped beating for 30 minutes and he went into hospital and he was in a coma. And I found out about this on the evening of this Thursday. And obviously I was completely devastated. And then I had to get up on the Friday to deliver a webinar. And on that webinar were some people who I knew, knew Ian. So I'm going onto the webinar thinking, on the one hand, Habit number one, be professional, deliver, do your job. And, and if I followed that habit slavishly, I probably would say, right, I'm not going to mention this that's happened with Ian because it's not professional. Uh, you know, these people have come, they paid their good money to get a, a job done and I'm there to do the job. And, and this other stuff that's going on is not relevant. So I could have pursued that path. But the, the habit of openness was sort of screaming at me saying, John, how can you be an authentic human being and friend if you do not declare this, uh, you know, in this webinar. So I'm wrestling with, the, with these two things going on in my head and I decide to go in and I actually de and I declare it. And I say, look, there's something I need to share with you before we start this webinar. And, and, I, and, and as I spoke, I, I could feel myself getting, you know, quite upset. Um, and and uh, anyway, I, I finished the webinar and I'm thinking, did I do the right thing? Did I not do the right thing? I'm in a bit of a dilemma about it. And somebody sent me an email from that webinar and said, John, um, thank you for sharing what you shared this morning about Ian. If you hadn't have said something, it would have felt a bit weird. And I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? There was me thinking it would be weird to talk about it. But actually, there are people there who say it would have been very odd, John, if you hadn't have mentioned something about this. So that was a real lesson to me, David, about my own 
journey with this habit and and my own sort of uh, comfort zone and, and and where I am and you know I'm definitely still working on this as a as an area where you know I don't profess to be the most open one and um, and I'm still working on it so that's one level at which is important to me the other level which we, we always come to is the the level of of my faith and why it's important to me um, in terms of my Christian faith and of course you know, I think about Jesus as, as, as the leader of, of that, that, that faith. And I you know, think about what he did in terms of this habit. And of course, one of Jesus' famous uh, comments is, the truth will set you free. Mm-hmm. And I think about this often in relation to this habit and a lot of what we've talked about today. Fiona said, when you are open, it dispels fear. Now, how different is that to saying, the truth will set you free? Um, because the more you can speak the truth of who you are, the more authentic you can be, the freer you are of that mask uh, that you've been wearing uh, and the lighter you will walk as a leader. So to me, that phrase, the truth will set you free, is a powerful statement about this, about this habit. Um, the other uh, aspect of, uh, you know, when I think about my faith, do you know, David, what is the shortest verse in the whole Bible. I do, because it's actually my favourite one. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Well done, my <laughs> friend. Well done, my friend. Chapter 11, verse 35. <laughs> Book of John. The yes. shortest verse yes. in the Bible. Jesus yeah. wept. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what is the context, uh, David? Uh, your, your bonus question here is, what is the context in which the, that comment was made? It's just a fabulous comment, because it is when Jesus goes and raises Lazarus from the, de- from, from the dead, doesn't he? Yeah. 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 And he and he was broken. I mean, he, mm. he, he came to that scene. The crowd was there. The family was there and his heart broke. And it just says Jesus wept. So here he is, you know, this son of God, this this incredible um, leader who wept. Um, you know, I don't think I've ever seen the phrase Donald Trump wept. <laughs> Boris Johnson Mm. wept. Um, You know, I I just, it's not a phrase that you typically see on a leader's epitaph. You know, Mm. here lies a man or woman who wept. But Jesus, I think, um, because of his heart, um, could do do nothing else uh, in that situation. So I think of that as as Jesus showing his utter humanity um, and, you know, the, the openness habit you know, and after he wept, he performed a miracle. He delivered. He delivered immediately after he wept. So this tension between the habits of being open and, and, and doing your job, um, you're getting things done. Um, you can do both. And, and I think that's the example that we've seen there and the example that we need to sort of really hold fast to if we want to sort of do both and practice, you know, all of these habits together. What a, what a great example, John. And actually, it tie, when you were speaking, it ties back to what you said earlier, because, you know, wherever you come from, a, you know, the faith perspective, one, one thing I had was, let's just consider the, the thought that Jesus knew he was going to heal Lazarus. What he didn't do as a leader is when he arrived, as you said before, they, he could have seen that the mayhem and all the grief going on, and he could have just fixed it straight away. Because you said before, you know, we can't say, oh, we'll fix that. But people being vulnerable, there's grief, no doubt, no doubt, you know, wailing and weeping, we know what's happening. So the first thing he did was actually get in touch with his own vulnerability. And he, as you said, Jesus wept. So what a great example of not just jumping in to fix it, but actually being there, I think, alongside and with the people. Yeah. Um, and it's, not, it's just great, actually, because it's another great example of leadership, because almost like leadership alongside, coming alongside them. It wasn't kind of power over them. Don't worry, I'm fixing it. I'm here. I'm the great power. I'll do it. First of all, he came alongside. Yeah. And yeah. Pace, pace, then lead. Pace, then lead is, is what I'm reminded of there. Mm. That, you know, he, paced, he paced the humanity of the situation and then he led through his divinity. Yeah. Um, you know, so... So yeah, I think it's I think it's a it's, a, it's an inspiring example. One further one because we're recording this just after Easter that I wanted to share, and I think the power we have on these sharings, John, is 
that I think when we get into these these stories, and I said to you before, I've actually been to the Holy Land, Israel, Palestine, and seen these places. I've been to the Garden of Gethsemane. It really brings it alive and alive from a leadership perspective, because one thing I wanted to share, because I think it's so much about the open and it ties into the one you've just shared, is when Jesus is there, gone to send me on uh, and, and he knows he's about to be, be led off, but he's not sure. But he uses these words and he says, actually, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he says to disciples, stay here and keep a watch with me. Now, for a leader in such vulnerability, such openness about where he was in that moment, because I believe in that moment that he was himself entirely distraught, but he didn't hide that. He chose to be open in, in that moment. Yeah. And, and obviously it's, it's been recorded. So, but what, you know, what's an example for someone who, who might hold up what a leader, what an example of, you know, what a person, he was someone who was distraught, but was choosing to share and choosing to ask for their support as well, which is yeah. oh, really powerful. Yeah, asking for help. Um, so yeah, no, I think lots of examples, David, um, uh, there that uh, are very inspiring. So um, now, now staying on this theme, I know that you've um, we've spoken about just an executive book, but you've also published a book, coaching poetry from a spiritual path, where you say whatever your own religious beliefs, these poems will challenge you to think deeply and inspire you to take the next step on your own spiritual path, your leadership path. So this is the moment actually where I invite you to share a poem from the book, which is really connected with you around this habit of choosing to be open. Yeah, um, thank you, David. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna share a poem today called The Hinterland. And again, you know, just maybe curious, David, The Hinterland, what, what, do you, what does that word, conjure up for you that when I use the word the hinterland what would you know as, as, as the hinterland hinterland for me actually Johnny it's very relevant for this time for me for my understanding it's like this liminal space it's on the edge of things betwixt and between things and it's, yeah. it can be quite a bleak space really yes yeah yeah that, that, that's right and it is it's, it's it's defined as the undeveloped rural land outlying a coastal port mm. that's where it it comes from a reason, but as you say, it's that space of of undeveloped, um, you know, the, the, the space that hasn't been explored. And to explore, it requires openness, I think. You know, it, it requires us to enter into that open space. So that's what the title caught my my eye. And, and when I share this poem, it's, it's all about two people in a relationship. It could be a leader and a follower. Uh, looking to explore how brave might they be to be open to explore the hinterland of their relationship. So let me, let, with that sort of backdrop, let me, let me share this. The hinterland. To not invade, nor be invaded. To realise what I am doing does not need defending for it is eternal and invulnerable. To stand on the border of you and I and stand down all the armies that led me here. Firm and upright and looking you in the eye to feel the power that flows through me, yet to know that it will not consume me, nor will I be tempted to use it irresponsibly nor will I shy away from it such that others will lay false claim. And there to balance the polarities in me, recognize, be with, and then unite a masculine, feminine, red, blue, left, right, hot, cold, composite. And here to live and breathe, connected to my source in joy and release, not fixing you, nor being fixed, not caring, nor caring not, not rushing on, nor rushing back, not looking away, nor staring down, but blazing in a neutral glory as God intended me to be, like a flower opening its petals to the sun, giving without ego, receiving without guilt, 
breathing in and breathing out, like a tide that ebbs and flows around its core, and knowing that in this space, all who find me will find themselves. All who reach out will be reaching in. All that could be will forever be, as gently in forgiveness, a healing stream washes through this world when we stand together in the hinterland. Oh my goodness, John. That is just wonderful. That could be a subject of a podcast in itself, I'm telling you. <laughs> so many really cracking great points in there. You know, you know, when you speak about, you know, polarities, you know, you had you had to deliver in there. There's just so many, uh, sorry, um, yes, no, sorry, defend. That was the word we had defend it. Where am I defending on things? That really caught me. And I the images you were just reading that just came to mind. <laughs> Gosh, it's so rich. You know, I quite often say to execs, well, you can read something perhaps if you've got a gathering or a team meeting and you know, there's something like that would be such a rich sharing for people to say, actually, this bit spoke to me or that bit, because there's so many parts in there. I'm going to go back to it. I have the book and uh, I'll have an explore of that. Thank you. That's quite wonderful. When you've worked out what it all means, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> I will do. But isn't that, I mean, this is perhaps part of the 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 the, um, the mystical side of perhaps of choosing to be open that and maybe this is this my, my final point on this, that it's an interesting one, isn't it? This is really quite a deep point, because I think as, as, a, as a male white leader, we can actually be, actually leadership happens when I turn up and it's done, it's done by me. I do it because I'm the leader and I do it. But I think what you're unlocking there for me is that actually this deeper sense of actually leadership is done through me. I'm responding perhaps in this case, you know, as we've as we said before, whatever faith or not faith you may have or a sense of as something that's guiding or something you can pull on, you're pulling on this because it's actually a sense of, actually, this is not about me. It's not me with power over. It's me with power with, so mm -hmm. with others. And, and maybe the power, as we've said before, is coming through me. And I just think there are so many great points there. I want to listen to that again after the, we've done this because I think it's so rich for people just to think, well, how does that touch me? What does that mean for me? So thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Pleasure. Right. Now, finally, after such a rich podcast, how can those listening uh, discover and explore the nine habits of trust, maybe via a keynote or workshop program or sign up for the newsletter? What, what can you recommend people to do to find out more? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's there's the book, um, you know, there's the poetry book for that matter, if people are grabbed by that, but there's uh, there's the Trust Executive book. Um, and, uh, you know, beyond that, there's lots of uh, resources on the web, um, you know, including this podcast, David, which you've uh, kindly sort of hosted. Um, so I think, I'd like to think there's a lot of um, trails that people can follow. And if people really want to start looking at working with this in their own leadership, in their own teams, in their own culture, then our team at the Trust Executive Foundation is very experienced in helping people go on this journey, uh, helping people bring it to life, helping people make it a real day-to-day -day habit um, for a leader and their, and their team. And so, you know, we, we'd be delighted, obviously, to engage with anybody who, who wants to um, take it further, because you know, at heart, as you say, I'm a practical person, you know, I, I love the theory and I think the theory is important, but the theory is no good unless, you know, somebody really starts to uh, put this into action. And uh, so we're, we're very keen to help leaders who want to rely on the power of trust. Mm, thank you, John. I just want to say, actually, you know, having reached this midway point of, of, the, of the fifth habit, you know, in my work with, with conscious leadership, and I don't think I've shared this with you before, but the trusted executive model, the book and, and the resources that you have are always something that actually I point people to as an option. There's a number of great resources out there. But the re one of the reasons I do is actually, it's just for me, we talk about this podcast being a deep dive. I say to people, actually, if you're serious about making a difference in your organization, you talk about triple bottom line. I said, this is one resource. This is one model. This is actually something which is not just well-researched. It actually has a practical implication. And what I love about it, John, is actually you can pull in the tools you're already using in your organization. And so it's not a, 
move everything out of the way, we're coming through, all you need is a trusted executive <laughs> framework. It's actually saying this is coming in and guess what? You can bring your things to the table and actually it can actually empower those and actually have a much bigger impact. So thank you, John. And, and really just want to say, you know, thank you, John, for stepping out in the business all this way with a real heart and a real passion for supporting businesses to be the very best that they can. And uh, I just invite you at this moment just to say a few words in closing to our, to our listeners. Yeah, I hope that uh, you've uh, enjoyed the session. Hope you've, again, I always say this, don't I? Just take one thing. Uh, don't, don't try and boil the ocean. Uh, you know, take, take one thing. You might have heard one story that inspired you, one example of a tip that you could use. And um, I hope that it's just given you something different in your working day. Uh, and that in the next 24 hours, if you can be that little bit more open or catch somebody else being a little bit more open and, and recognize them for that, then, uh, you know, this will have been, uh, you know, a, a really enjoyable uh, experience for, for, uh, for David and I to sort of help you make a difference. So thank you for listening. Mm. And thank you, John. And uh, our next habit for next time, habit number six is choosing to be humble. So I'm also looking forward to that one. So until next time, may you all have a wonderful day. <laughs>